going to begin by reading verses 8 through 14. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith, in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was also hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, to the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning that we've been able to have your word read in our hearing, sing songs of praise unto you, to pray and ask your mercy upon us. And once again, we ask that in this time of preaching, that your spirit would deal with our souls according to the truth that is preached from your word. It is your spirit alone that deals with the souls of men. And we ask, according to your will, that that work be done. That you would bring glory unto yourself through the preaching of your word. We give thanks unto you that we have an opportunity to hear the word preached. And may you be glorified in it. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Now specifically this morning, I'm going to be looking at verses 13 and 14. But I want to give a little bit of an introduction to uh, this letter to the church at Colossae, as well as some of the thoughts of surrounding verses here. And if you want some more, uh, some more teaching on the book of Colossians, uh, Stephen Henderson uh, preached through the book of Colossians in one of our Sunday evening services and uh, did so for several, several months. And you can hear some more detailed information there. But specifically, I want to deal with this from the context of forgiveness. What is the sense of forgiveness? Last week, we said forgiveness in Psalm, in Psalm 130. Its purpose is to address the factual charge of the sinner's guilt before a holy God. This week, forgiveness is a part of God's intricate plan to bring dead souls to life by His grace. Forgiveness is a part of God's intricate plan to bring dead souls to life by His grace. Now, once again, I want to remind you that to look at the practical aspects of forgiveness first, lots of people want to talk about, how do I forgive my family member or my coworker or my friend or a spouse or so forth. And they want to talk about forgiveness in that context. And that certainly has its place and it certainly is important. But if you're going to think about forgiveness from its very foundations, you have to think about it from the context of the gospel. That's the context in which we must understand how forgiveness has practical outworkings. And so once again, we're going to look at this upon the idea of forgiveness in the whole of the context of building a foundation and what it means in the context of the gospel. And in this letter, Paul's writing to this church in Colossae. And it's a church that he had never visited. Matter of fact, he notes in the letter that he had not been with them and that they had learned of the gospel through Epaphras. Now, Epaphras had given them some a great understanding of the gospel because it's evident in Paul's letter he's already giving them uh, some assumptions of what they've heard and he's reinforcing the things that Epaphras had already taught to them. 
And he's also dealing with a context of troubles in the church from those outside. This seems to be a continual issue in the churches. There's always some kind of problem that's taking place. As Paul continues to deal with these issues in the church, uh, especially in Colossae here, he warns them against uh, particular teachings. Now, there's several things he begins to talk to them about, but most of all, he's dealing with the context of understanding Christ properly. And once again, the Judaizers are rearing their ugly heads. They're wanting to really get in there and teach a works-based salvation about circumcision and the context of circumcision. And so we're going to see Paul is dealing with all of that, especially in this section of the letter. Now, as he deals with these things, he brings out uh, believing Gentiles and the context of believing Jews, and there's going to be some clash between the two if they're not careful, and that's surrounded with this issue of circumcision. So Paul notes here some important things about circumcision, just as he did in his letter to Galatia. And we need to take note of that. So this morning I want to begin with two particular thoughts that I think will be helpful to us through uh, verses 8 through uh 8 through 12. If you correctly understand Christ, then all other matters begin to fit the puzzle. If you correctly understand Christ, then all other matters begin to fit the gospel puzzle. The gospel puzzle. Notice in verse 8, he, he doesn't want them to be deceived. Don't be captive. Whatever these philosophies are, a lot of times when people uh, look at these philosophies, uh, yes, there's some, uh, you know, Gentile context to the issue here, but some of the philosophies and the traditions of men are things that he's dealing with the Judaizers. Because each one of these churches that are planted, even though Paul didn't plant this church, they come out of a Jewish context. They often come from the gospel being preached in a, uh, in a Jewish synagogue in, in one of these towns or cities or wherever it may be. There are Jews hearing of this. The gospel message has been spreading. Paul notes that in the opening of his uh, statements uh, to the letter uh, here in Colossae to say, this gospel's going out to the world. It's been an amazing thing that's taken place. And so lots of philosophies are trying to interact with this gospel uh, that's being preached. And the Jews themselves are interacting with it and causing difficulties. And one of the difficulties they're causing is they're causing uh, people not to understand Christ correctly. Paul makes that clear when he says, uh, not to be captive to these things, he says, rather than according to Christ. And then in verse 9, he says, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He's telling us something specific about Christ. Now, I'm not going to go into that in detail, but you need to understand everything we're going to say about forgiveness is going to set up uh, or is going to be set up by our understanding of who Christ is. Christ is very God of very God and very man of very man. And, and Paul outlines that here in a very succinct statement. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Christ is God. He came to this earth, born of the virgin, and took on human flesh. And he is God. Not but or or, and he is God. He goes on and says, And in Him, this is speaking of Christ, you have been made complete. Whatever has happened to you spiritually, whatever has happened in your souls, church in Colossae, this has been something that has made you complete, and it's complete in Christ. It's not complete in your works. It's not complete in your thoughts. It's not complete in the philosophies of men. It's not complete in the traditions of, of Judaizers. It's complete in Christ. And he says, and he is the head over all rule and authority. We have to get Christ correct in our understanding of who he is to understand the gospel and to understand forgiveness and the effects and impacts of forgiveness, whatever they may be. 
And he says, let me just sum this up by telling you, Christ is the head over all rule and authority. There's nothing that Christ is not head over. He's head over the church. Christ has authority over the world. Christ has authority over a virus. Christ has authority over whatever may happen because of a virus. Christ has authority over all things. There's nothing that is outside of the authority of Christ. So this is important. Paul wants to set this up. Secondly, though, by way of introduction, if you appropriately understand spiritual imagery, salvific matters further fit the gospel puzzle. If you appropriately understand spiritual imagery, salvific matters further fit the gospel. Now that word salvific, we don't often use it, but it's just a word for salvation. What are, what are all the things about salvation surrounding salvation? It just fit better in the sentence, so I used it. Uh, but it's, it's just, that's what it's dealing with. Now what is the spiritual imagery that Paul gets at in this text? Well, notice in verse 11. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Well, there's an imagery here speaking of circumcision. Circumcision is a physical procedure, yet Paul uses the imagery in a sense where he's saying this is a circumcision that was made without hands. It was done without hands. We'll get a little more to what that circumcision is in just a little while. The other imagery is the imagery of baptism and the resurrection. He says, having been buried with him in baptism, speaking of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now there's physical things that are happening and imagery things that are happening. Christ literally came, lived a perfect life, and died a sinner's death on the cross. He literally did that. That's real. It's actual. It's historical. It happened. The very Son of God came onto this earth. He lived in a Roman culture as a Jew, born of a Jewish woman, and he lived in that context, and he lived a perfect life, and he died a sinner's death. They hung him on a cross, and they murdered him. That happened. And he was raised from the dead on the third day. That literally happened. But Paul says, having been buried with him in baptism. This gives us an imagery of what baptism is. Baptism does not accomplish salvation. Baptism is a proclamation through imagery of what has happened in the very soul of a person. When you are baptized, you are saying to the world, I was dead in my sins, and I have been raised to life in Christ Jesus. It's, it's imagery. Furthermore, in that imagery, he says, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God. Something took place in your soul that you were raised up through faith, and it was God who did this. So there's the imagery of baptism there, or excuse me, the imagery of death and resurrection that goes with baptism, it tells us something took place in our souls. If you read this in hard literalism, you won't understand what Paul say. Now certainly you always have to be careful. We don't want to go as, as far as, as some have gone in the past to take passages and take the literal words and context and mix them all up and say things the Bible doesn't say. But at the same time, we have to be careful that we're not afraid to see imagery and right perspective in the Scripture. It certainly can't be said here that what Paul is talking about is that these people in Colossae had actually physically been dead and buried and then they physically actually were raised up with Christ. That's not what he's talking about. Baptism is an in imagery here of something that happened in the soul. And there's also a third imagery here 
And we move into that in verse 13, and that's going to be our main focus this morning. He says, when you were dead in your transgressions. It's the imagery of the dead souls of men. Now, he uses a word dead that has a very physical context to it. We know what dead means in a physical sense, don't we? Nobody's going to argue over going to a funeral or a viewing of a person in a casket and stand there and argue about whether the person's dead. That makes no sense. We look at the person in the casket. They're no longer breathing. We know what has happened. They are dead. But Paul wants to use this in the sense of the soul. It's a literal sense in one context of what has happened to the soul, but it's not literal in the sense that the soul was buried physically because the soul is not physical. It's another portion of imagery that's really important for us as we walk through the text. The issue of the deadness here is once again dealing with guilt, the guilt of man before a holy God. It tells us that we are not innocent. Even in our own present laws, there is a way to deal with murderers. Many states still have the death penalty. When one commits a murder and they are convicted of that murder appropriately in a lawful, just court, they may be sentenced to death. If they're not sentenced to death, they are often put in prison for life. Now, what is the court saying to the person? They're saying you are guilty, but they're also saying what? You are not innocent. It's funny when you think about prison situations. I've preached in several prisons over the years. I've talked to prisoners sitting around tables, and I can't tell you the number of times that a prisoner has told me they were innocent. Now, the Innocent Project says that about 1% of those imprisoned in the United States of America are probably innocent. They've overturned around 250 cases in three decades of people that have been innocent. If their percentage is right, that means about 20,000 people approximately are imprisoned wrongly. In one sense, we would say that's a travesty. We would want to stand up for a person who's innocent. We would want to make sure that person was not wrongly accused, that they didn't see, receive a penalty that was not theirs. Well, that's very important imagery for us as we think about what Paul is saying about dead souls. Why are dead souls dead? Because they're not innocent. They are pronounced dead because of their guilt. The difference here is that these dead souls have no percentage or possibility of not being guilty. Absolutely no percentage whatsoever. They have absolutely no percentage whatsoever of not being guilty. When we stand before a holy God, the reason we are pronounced dead in our sins is because God is the judge and He is holy. He is good. He is right. He is perfect. So therefore, He makes no wrong judgment. A court in America may make a wrong judgment. A jury in America may, may, may make a wrong judgment. But sinners standing before a holy God cannot say, whoa, whoa, time out. We're working on a, on a, a DNA a project here that might show that 1% of sinners are actually innocent. 
No one can stand before God and say that. That's the difference. God's justice is perfect justice. God's judgment is perfect judgment. Brings us to our first main point this morning. Dead souls do not live in innocence. Dead souls do not live in innocence. You say, well, Pastor Brandon, you sure are starting off negative again today. Well, I have to deal with the reality of the situation and deal with the negativity to get to the positivity. And we shouldn't be afraid of the negativity because it tells us something real about who we are as humans. And it makes the grace of God ever more joyful. So the recognition is the first place to start is dead souls do not live in innocence. Paul says, when you were dead in your transgressions. He's saying to these believers in the church at Colossae, there was a time that you were dead. And you were dead in your transgressions. This is a a soul imagery, a spiritual imagery, talking about the souls of men, the very essence of men and women. The problem with death is not just the physical nature of it, that one is no longer breathing. The problem is is that the soul is immortal and something has to be done with that soul. The souls of dead sinners, apart from Christ, are rightly judged by God and condemned. Dead souls do not live in innocence. Not only is Paul implying that in this text, But it's an idea that we get in various places in Scripture. And I don't have time this morning to rehearse every Scripture with you, but every human being is dead in sin at conception. Job 15, what is man that he could be pure? And and he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous. Psalm 51, 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, is what the psalmist says. And in sin, my mother conceived me. This is not an issue of somebody becoming a sinner at age 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or 10. The Scripture is teaching that we are conceived in sin. This is the the heritage that we have from Adam and Eve. It's being passed down to every human. This is the, the seed of Adam being woven through all of history in every human soul. We are dead in our sins even at conception. Every human being is dead in sin in the whole of their being. Every human being is dead in sin in the whole of their being. Proverbs 20, who can say, I have cleansed my heart, I am pure from sin. If people just want to talk about physical activity and say, well, you know, physically some people do bad things. In Proverbs it says, who can say, I have cleansed my heart. It's another word for soul, heart, soul. The idea of heart, soul, and mind, the very essence of the being of uh, of a person. Who, Who can say that they have cleansed their soul and that I am pure from my sin? Proverbs writer is saying that no one can do this. Ecclesiastes, for there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. The hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. Isaiah 53, we all know, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Isaiah 64, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The Gospels and the words of Jesus don't get any better, even though people want to talk about how sweet Jesus is all the time. I like to say that Jesus was really honest. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave 
to sin. He says, from within, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that all are under sin. Just doesn't get much better, does it? it sounds terrible. It is terrible. It's awful. Paul says in very various other places that we were slaves of sin. We cannot please God in and of our flesh. And he says at least twice, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead. We're dead in conception. From the very conception of our person in the womb, we're dead in the very whole of our being. If you've hated a person in your heart, you've committed murder is what Jesus said. What person could stand up to that judgment? How many people have I been angry at or hated? Even if it was for a split second, there was this anger in me, this, this hate in me for that split moment, whatever the situation or the occasion was. Who, how many times have I been there? How many times have I been there and not even thought much about it afterwards? How many times have I been in that place and not even really genuinely asked forgiveness? My heart is a wicked, wicked thing left to itself. Well, after Paul makes this judgment, he begins to bring us out of this great mire, this great bog of awful, dirty, muddy, stinking sin. Because in verse 13, he says, He made you alive together with Him. He made you alive together with Him. This is good news because it brings us to our second point this morning. Dead souls do not raise themselves. Dead souls do not live in innocence and dead souls do not raise themselves. This is good news. I don't know about you recently, but I've never uh, you know, been out to uh, a graveyard or, or anything like that and see dead people raise themselves. They don't generally do that. If a dead body is going to be uh, exhumed or, or brought from the grave or to be uncovered in any way, something else has to do it. The dead body doesn't do it itself. Maybe years of erosion over a grave that the body is uncovered. And, uh, for some reason, the body is exhumed. If you've ever had to bury a dead animal, one of your concerns is that other animals will uncover it and spread it all around. That's always joyous. Dead souls do not raise themselves just like dead bodies do not raise themselves. If a soul is dead, it cannot raise itself. And Paul tells us, He, speaking of God, He, God, made you alive together with Him, that is Christ. He's saying, 
This is what God did. Just as God, by the very Spirit, the Holy Spirit, raised Christ from the dead, so it is that God himself, by that same Spirit, raises dead souls to life in Christ. Paul wrote to Titus and said, He saved us, speaking of God. God saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. This regenerative work done by the very Spirit of God, whom He poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified or being declared right, by His grace, we would be made heirs. There's that doctrine of adoption we studied some months ago. We would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God is active first in bringing dead souls to life. God is the one who does this. This makes sense with the spiritual imagery that Paul has given us in the text. It makes sense with the spiritual imagery of circumcision. The idea here is that circumcision is a great change. In its physical procedure, it is a great change. In its spiritual procedure, it is a great change. The circumcision of the heart or the soul is a great change. A soul which was once dead in its sin. A heart which loved wickedness is what the Bible says about that heart. A heart that was desperately wicked and who could know it? That heart, that soul has great change when God acts first and raises that soul to life. That's an amazing work. You and I couldn't resurrect a thing. I couldn't even throw a penny on the ground and make it come up. But God takes dead souls and raises them to life. This circumcision imagery is this great change that takes place. If we were to see a dead person come out of a grave, wouldn't we say that was a great change? Wouldn't you say that was something different? Wouldn't you just stand there for a moment and think to yourself, this is no big deal. I see this all the time. Is that what you would do? I think not. I think if we saw a dead body come out of a grave, that would catch our attention, wouldn't it? This is what God does with dead sinners, dead souls. He brings them to life. And He does so in Christ. This is why you have to understand Christ. Get Christ right for the gospel puzzle to make sense. If you don't get Christ right, the gospel puzzle doesn't make sense. If men are just kind of sick people and Jesus is just kind of a good guy, then what's the purpose of the gospel? It, we really don't need it. Because basically just kind of sick people, you can kind of help them get well if you kind of work at it hard enough after a while. We're talking about viruses and vaccines and all the work we're doing in genetic this and genetic that and blah, 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 blah. We're not talking here about vaccinating people from sin. We're talking about people being dead in their sins. And the great change is the very work of God to circumcise their hearts. It also makes sense with the spiritual imagery of bad baptism. Dead souls do not clean them, cleanse themselves and dead souls do not raise themselves. You've never seen anything dead take a bath, have you, by itself? One of the Puritans said, We shudder to touch the dead bodies of our friends, but God is not only ready to touch our dead souls, but to embrace them. And not only that, but would even restore them to life. God is not only willing, He's ready and he's able to take dead souls and make them alive in Christ. Now that's a miracle. That's 
a miracle. We have to say that God is active first and man is active second. Whenever we want to talk about faith in Christ, something cannot have faith when it is dead. A dead soul does not have faith by itself. It's God who acts first, making the soul alive by the power of the Holy Spirit that enables that sinner to believe. We need to see this is a a great work here. This is all a part of forgiveness. If we're going to talk about forgiveness, what we're talking about here is God doing something based on another happening. How is it that God could do this and act this way first? How is it that men can stand before God if it were not for genuine forgiveness of their sins? Brings us to our third and final point this morning. Dead souls... Do not know forgiveness. Dead souls do not live in innocence. Dead souls do not raise themselves. And dead souls do not know forgiveness. Understanding forgiveness requires an understanding of the nature of the very sin or the crime itself. The sin is against this infinite holy God, the one and only true holy God, And this sin has an infinite penalty. If the sin is against an infinite God, then the sin has an infinite penalty. That means the sin requires an infinite forgiveness. Infinite forgiveness. The word here translated forgiveness comes from the idea of to graciously show favor. The word in and of itself has a connotation of the very grace of God. God is holy. God is just. God is good. God is love. God is gracious. His grace has to be infinite because our sin is infinite against Him. We are in need of a forgiveness that has an infinite context to it. And Paul begins to explain that to us. Because he says in verse 14, he says, Having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of the decree against us, What decree is that? It's a decree of all our sin is against God. If God is infinite, then that decree against us is infinite. Begs a question. We're finite, correct? We have a beginning and an end. God has no beginning and no end. He is. He just is. How is a finite person going to pay the debt of an infinite penalty to an infinite God or the infinite God? Paul tells us it's not possible. God has to cancel out the certificate of debt consisting of the decrees against us It's even telling us that this this decree against us was hostile. We we certainly want to know the love of God, but we have to understand the wrath of God too. Both are important. God is hostile towards sin. God will pour out His wrath on sin. How is it that God dealt with this holy hostility toward our decree? or toward the decree against us and our sin. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now remember, 
All these previous verses have been building up the person and work of Christ, who Christ is and what Christ has done. And here's what he's saying. When Christ went to that cross, Christ was paying that debt. It tells us something about Christ, doesn't it? It tells us something about Christ and it tells us something about the very forgiveness of God. And to understand those concepts, I want you to hear four observations. Number one, an infinite debt is unpayable by a finite person. An infinite debt is unpayable by a finite person. If you begin to think about your sin in the context of finiteness and infiniteness, you'll begin to understand your works really do mean nothing. Your sin and the decree against your sin is by an infinite God and your sin is in the infinite holiness, uh, holy context of who God is. You cannot of your own righteousness pay that debt because you are finite. You have a beginning and you have an end. If there's an infinite debt to be paid, it takes something or someone infinite to pay it. just like paying off your mortgage. However long the mortgage is, 15, 20, 30 years, whatever it may be, how are you going to pay it off? You pay it off over those years. And when they send you a letter that say it, says it's paid off, then it's paid off, and you actually own that home. Until then, it's not paid off. But there's an end date, a start date and an end date. Our sin is in the context of an infinity. We can't pay it. Number two, an infinite redeemer alone is capable of, of, paying the, uh, of paying the infinite debt of sin. An infinite redeemer alone is capable of paying the infinite debt of sin. This is what Christ did. Very God of very God, very man of very man. Christ, infinite in his essence, in his being, Christ went to the cross. He paid the debt. An infinite Redeemer paid an infinite debt of sin. It paid the debt of your sin from the past. It paid the de debt of your sin in the present. And it pays the debt of your sin in the future. And it pays the debt of all of it. There's not one sin that will get away from that debt being paid by Christ. Nothing will show up at the end. There won't be a computer printout uh, from somebody uh, that says, Oh, by the way, you, you missed this sin. No, Christ paid it. It's paid. All of it. They won't send you something in the mail saying, you still owe us 37 cents. Heard of a man one time that paid off his car. A few months later received a note in the mail that he still owed 37 cents. And if he didn't pay it, they were going to turn it over to a collections agency and go after his credit. The work of Christ and redemption is not like that. There won't be a letter saying that you owe 37 cents. It is paid in full and paid all. Because Christ Himself is infinite in being. And that means His work of redemption is infinite. Thirdly, an infinite redemption institutes infinite forgiveness. This kind of forgiveness is infinite in and of itself. It tells us why the Lord Jesus could say, what about forgiving your brother? Seventy times seven. You begin to see how, in some sense, the forgiveness we receive from God ought to have a bearing of how we think about forgiving others around us. But when we strive in that forgiveness in and of ourselves, we will fall. And we will fail to forgive like we should. And the only hope we have is not our own works of forgiveness, but our only hope is in the forgiveness of Christ. An infinite forgiveness. 
And infinite redemption institutes an infinite forgiveness. It's forgiveness for sin you don't even know you've committed. It's forgiveness for sin that you will have committed, moved forward from that sin, and in the future you'll forget that you committed it or not even know of it. This forgiveness is so amazing, it goes beyond anything we could even imagine. There are so many sins that we don't even acknowledge in our whole lifetime that we've committed, and yet those who have repented and believed in Christ Jesus alone to save them from their sin, that forgiveness covers even those sins. Fourthly and lastly, an infinite forgiveness requires infinite grace. An infinite forgiveness requires infinite grace. God has gracious, graciously shown favor on His people. All those who have repented and believed and had faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save them from their sin, they know of an infinite grace. A grace that has no measure. A grace that has no stopping point. A grace that has no kryptonite. You know, there's nothing that can stop the grace of God from working according to God's purpose and God's plan for His glory in all of this world? Nothing. There's, there's no dictator. There's no democratic government. There, there's no king. There, there's no people group. There's no, uh, uh, you know, any warring faction. There's no military progress. There's nothing in all of this world that will stop the very grace of God. It's an infinite grace. And it's an amazing grace. And it's all built on the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is the rock of ages. You know the word ages there? All of time, space, and history. When we begin to think about this kind of forgiveness in our own lives, our need for it, it ought to help us begin to think about forgiving others. It has a pretty practical implication. But to really get a hold of those practical implications, we first really need to understand what it means for us as sinners. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've been merciful this morning to give us your word that teaches us of your great mercy and grace. Grace towards sinners through your Son, the Lord Jesus. We ask your mercy upon us as we sing and give praise unto you. We ask that your Spirit continue in the rest of this day to work in our souls according to the word preached. May you gain the glory for all of that which is spoken truthfully. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.